I'm Rachel Goldsworthy and welcome to the drive home to Hawkesbury where I believe every home has a story and I love sharing those stories on real estate in the Hawkesbury with you. Here we share the best ways to add value to your property, how to avoid the common mistakes people make when buying and selling property and how to get the maximum return on your investment with a focus on supporting local business. I live love Hawkesbury and can't wait to get into today's episode with you so let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what time you're watching this video. I'm Rachel Goldsworthy on the drive home to Hawkesbury, and today I am joined by Mike Delta. This is Ro Romeo Golf to you. Do you read me? Over. How are you, Drew? <laughs> it's obviously not oh, good, Tower Speak. Trying... <laughs> oh, well, I, oh, I thought you were talking. Oh. That was a real box up there, right? How about I, I you know, cool. I was going that to say cool. uh, Romeo Golf to Mike Delta. Are you there? Over. <laughs> no, no, it'd, it'd be Delta Mike. Oh, Delta Mike. Okay, because you reverse yeah. it, of course. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, because, yeah, so. <laughs> I'm well, thanks, Rachel. How are you? Yeah, really good, thank you. It's so great to have you on the show today because um, a lot of people, we, we live in the Hawkesbury and we've got the towers and we've got the, the planes over flying and um, we get to see some beautiful planes and it's good to have somebody on like yourself that is able to share the information on what's actually happening in the air and um, your illustrious career in the, the RAF and also as a um, civilian now. So tell me a little bit about that. What's it like being an air traffic controller? Uh, well, it, it varies a lot. Richmond is a lot quieter than the bases I've been at. I've started my life over in Perth, where the Air Force had a they have their flying school over there, and so it's really, really busy. And then I've been at other places like Darwin and Williamtown, which are equally as busy but different. And then Richmond is a lot quieter than those places. So Richmond has its moments, uh, but uh, it's a quiet place, believe it or not. I don't think a lot of a lot of residents would believe that come sort of July or January when uh, the the hornets come down to do their stuff but certainly it is a lot quieter than it used to than it used to be and and compared to other bases no terrific and um, what changes are coming up with the base do you know of any sort of snippets that the locals don't know about or any insights Ooh. that you can tell us about or is that classified? oh well I <laughs> no no it's not classified I mean it's a fairly well known fact that um, the Spartan, so the the new two engine aircraft that we've got down there at the moment, they only they'll only be here till the end of the year, and then they relocate to Amberley. So we'll okay. go back to just having the squadron of Hercules. But I mean, essentially, Richmond is still the the transport hub of Sydney, and um, I I don't know. It's uh, it's it's something I don't really pay a lot of attention to as to how long the base is going to be there for. But you will have noticed that as you go along Hawkesbury Valley Way, they're building us a new control tower. So that that to me is a bit of a commitment. You probably have seen that. You know, this I have this big yes, sort of mushroom mushroom thing appearing in the middle of the base there. Now it's got a whole lot of blue tarp holding around it. Yeah, so it's, a, uh, it, so, so that's a commitment. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think John's joined us on the line, and Joe, and a few other people. So hello to everybody that's listening. Uh, great to have everybody with us. Equally, um, the, the towers, I mean, one was not enough. We needed two. There is a bigger commitment, as you say. So how many planes are coming in every day? What sort of, um, you know, traffic uh, would you it have? Varies. Yeah, we, we can have it. We had a day, a very busy day uh, the other day when I was there, and we had, uh, I don't know, probably 36 to 48 aircraft movements there. And it had a lot to do with the parachuting that we were doing. Uh, oh. Yet you get, you get quiet days that... Uh, are, are, are quite different. I believe that yesterday was a busy day. I uh, one of the uh, one of my trainee, trainees actually got his qualification yesterday, so that was pleasing. He sent me a text and said it was a really busy day. So, and I was in Richmond and I saw a lot of C-17s flying over. So, and and also a C-17 was there doing some circuit training there. So it was a reasonably yeah. busy day. Hmm. Wow, well, isn't that great to talk? get the certification? Yes, it is. It's a big. It's a big milestone in a junior controller's life to get. That's his first control rating. So, okay. and he graduated. He graduated from the school in in Gippsland about eighteen months ago. So, yes, this is a big, big step in his in his career. And tell me, um, Drew, what is it that somebody needs to do if they want to be a traffic air traffic controller? What is the training involved? Is it years? Is it months? Is it, you know, um, simulation? What do you do? What do you have to do? 
Okay. Um, the system is set up so they can take a person off the street who has no aviation background. They do about 20 weeks of officer training school down at, at the RAF base of sale, and that's just general officer training. So all of the all of the officers do the same training. And then they go off to the uh, School of Air Traffic Control, which happens to be at the same base down at East Sale, and they do about nine months there. So all in all, it's about 12 months of training. And uh, depending on whether whether the officer training uh, is like, fits hand in glove with going over to the school, some quite a lot of times it doesn't. So there's a bit of hanging yeah. around. But uh, about nine months later, you graduate as an air traffic controller. But that gives you the the... The, the skills to go out to a base and then get trained at that base to to drive the air traffic at that base and that's what this young yeah. fella's just done he's he's just wow. he so he completed he completed his training about uh, last year and uh, he's got his qualification now after doing some training you ask about the simulation the school at at sale has a a, a large very a, a very uh, um, comprehensive uh, air traffic control simulator which mirrors which mirrors an air traffic control tower. It's it's um it's a very big video game basically. It's a big room, or there are in fact two of them, and they have big screens around the outside, and okay. uh, it mirrors exactly what you would see in a control tower. And it's very very effective piece of piece of yeah. equipment. And when you're in that simulator, does it feel real? I mean, do you because you yeah. know it's a simulator because you're sitting in there? Do you think oh, it's just just something? you know, that you do and we're just going to get in there. We're going to play a bit of Xbox and, and uh, land this plane safely. <laughs> Surprisingly, no. Um, no. <laughs> I um, I was out of air traffic control for about 12 years doing other staff work and I had to go back and do a refresher in 2013 down at the school. And um, you do think, oh, it's just, they're just virtual pictures on the, on the, on the, on the screens and stuff. No, it's not yeah. like that at all. You really get really? into it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. It becomes. It becomes. I think a, a lot of a lot of people playing video games are the same. But this is this is encompassing. It's three hundred and sixty degrees, and you are okay. you're standing in what what is equivalent to a control tower, and you're busy, and you and you've got a lot of airplanes. There's a lot of inputs. You've got yes. to do a lot of processing and provide a lot of a lot of feedback. So mm. yeah, it does. It does get you in, and you, it is a workout. It's a big workout. It's mm-hmm. like being in the gym. Yeah, I'm sure. And the feedback that you would need to give to the pilots, I would think, would be fairly detailed on weather, on conditions, on, you know, surfaces, those sorts of things. Can you walk us through your typical landing? The 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 tower controller's role is to make sure that, that an aircraft landing and taking off on the runway doesn't collide with another something, whether it be a vehicle, a person or another v- aircraft. So the idea is that, whenever an aircraft takes off or whenever an aircraft lands and surprisingly people who sit on the sides of runways you are, or come up to the control tower, you ask them how fast is that aeroplane going? And they say, well, I don't know. And I say, well, the aeroplane is going at about 120 knots when it lands and takes off. And they go, I said, how does that relate to driving on the, on the road? And of course it's about double. So an aircraft oh. landing and taking off is doing about 240 kilometres an hour. Okay. But because it's kind of wide, wide open and large aeroplanes, it doesn't. There's kind of a, a relative thing. So you can yes. imagine, say, a, a Hercules is about about sixty tons of aeroplane, yes, and it's doing about two hundred and forty kilometres an hour. So landing and taking off, you don't want it to hit anything. So um, <laughs> preferably not. Yeah, that's a good point. Valid no, point. <laughs> so, so that that's the role of the air traffic control, and predominantly in a, in a control tower to make sure that. There is no obstructions on the runway for an aircraft landing and taking off. It mm. extends beyond that, particularly at, at Richmond. We have a lot more lateral space at Richmond because we encompass where they do the parachuting. You've probably seen a lot of parachuting yeah. at Rickaby's Creek and on the airfield itself and at Londonderry. Yes. So we encompass more more uh, lateral air, area than most other control towers. Um, but So we have a bit to do with... Um, Things like there's a lot of people around here own helicopters. Uh, we have the yeah. Rural Fire Service. They fly their helicopters around here. We have uh, rescue helicopters flying and out to go to different accidents. And we've got to keep them away also in the air from other aircraft in the air as well as landing and taking off. Yeah, sure. So um, There was a so bit of activity last night. 
wasn't it? There was a bit, bit of activity last night with um, helicopters overhead in Windsor and the Hawkesbury area. I believe there's some grass fires that they were putting out, the RFS and a few other people. You've, you've actually caught me on leave. <laughs> so I don't know. I wasn't at work yesterday. I'm, I'm on holidays. Right. <laughs> That's okay. So I, I don't, know, I don't yeah. know exactly what was going on. But, yeah, that, that happens. That's why... My, my my first year here, or my first uh, few months here after getting my qualification back uh, was that period in 2013 when we had all those really bad bushfires around the Hawkesbury and up on the Blue Mountains. Yeah, right. And we had, uh, we had probably two dozen RFS aircraft stationed at Richmond, and it was manic. It was, you know, there was helicopters, there was the little fixed-wing aircraft that dumped the fire retardant mm -hmm. plus the big aircraft that were dumping the fire retardant as well. So it was really crazy. So yeah. we do do a lot of work with the Rural Fire Service. Wow, okay. And in regards to the planes that you have at the airport, what is the smallest plane and the capacity of that and what would be the largest plane? Well, because we're the transport hub of Sydney, we get a lot of aircraft coming and going. For example, the other day we had one of the PC-9 trainers, which is a, an, a pilot trainer. The, it came up from East Sire where the Central Flying School is in the home of the Roulettes. Um, that's the primary pilot training aircraft, and they're based norm. They're based at Pierce, where two flying training school is. But at Sale, they treat, teach the pilots to become instructors. So one of those flew up on Friday. Right. But okay. we have everything. So we have uh, quite often we'll have the VIP aircraft come in. Like yesterday, I saw one of the challenges come in. That's a, a little biz jet. That's about it's about ten or twelve thousand kilograms. And it's um, the one that. So we'll fit probably half a dozen people and fly around Australia or the Governor-General to go to sort of places like Wagga or some of these regional places. Is that um, a white colour? We also, yes, yeah, it was the yeah. little white aeroplane that came yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So we'll have them. We have the we have the BBJs, which is also the 34 Squadron aircraft because we have our Hercs, which are based here. We have the C-17s, which are based up in Amberley, and they'll come down here both to do transport work, they'll pick up stuff here and go maybe for – so recently we had them for um, the relief effort in the Fiji and the Solomons and places like that, uh, but they also do other work like parachuting work. So they'll do – they'll pick up a load of parachutes and drop them over Richmond or they'll pick up some cargo, which has been set up with parachutes, and they'll drop it over London Derry. Okay. The parachutists that um, perform, do they also come out of the Hercules or is it only the C-17? No, they come out of they come out of the Spartans, the Hercules, and the C seventeens. Okay, and so they essentially just drop the back as they're flying along, and then everybody will just jump at a certain height. That's right. Yeah, generally the um, when they're learning to do it, they are on a on a uh, static line, which is the sort of thing you used to probably see in the movies, where in yeah. World War Two the parachutes would jump out of a uh, out of a uh, of a, a decoder, and and their parachutes would parachutes would open instantly. Yes. But we've come a long way since then. So that's basically the initial training. And I'll do that generally over at Rickaby's Creek. There's a big airfield, okay. a big field there between Rickaby's Creek and Windsor. And yes. uh, they do that at about 1,500 feet. But they right. vary between that and up to up to 10,000 feet where they, where they do free fall as well as, as the, the, uh, the static line. That's a long way off, isn't it? <laughs> They're scared of heights. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a little yeah, bit challenge. Yeah. I've I've actually seen them jump from eighteen thousand feet, but then I mean that's what happens down at uh, that's what they do down at Picton as well. You've probably been yeah. down the Hume Highway there, and they they're See jumping in out of the sky. 20, <laughs> yeah, they're jumping in anything up to twenty thousand feet. So yeah, where does the I mean, oxygen stop? <laughs> um, generally, you need you, you need supplemental oxygen from about ten thousand feet. Okay. So the guys that jump from the high levels. I think they use supplemental oxygen or they jump and they drop really quickly and they don't open their parachutes till below 10,000 feet. Wow. It's fascinating, this topic. Tell me, how did you get started in air traffic control? You were looking at becoming a pilot um, in Canberra, yeah, I believe. I grew up in Canberra and my whole sole focus in, in life was to become an Air Force pilot. I was kind of obsessed. Uh, joined the Air Force and uh, didn't make pilot training didn't cut the didn't cut the mustard at the rate they wanted me so yeah, yeah you get that but um i uh, was encouraged to consider air traffic control so i swapped over to air traffic control and I had a look back and that yeah. was in the early 80s and i've been doing this job now for 37 years so 
Wow. And it's taken me all over Australia, uh, both in postings uh, and in exercises, and it also took me overseas. I went to the Middle East in 1984. Um, but as I say, I've worked all over Australia. It's been fabulous because, I mean, I, I, I grew up in Canberra, a really closeted little company town. You know, they have a lot of pe- people, a lot of my peers joined the company, yeah. and they've all they've all retired now because they're there in that super scheme, but I'm still yeah. going and... Um, I'm, I've seen all of Australia and a lot of my peers, if they haven't been to Bali, they probably haven't been out of Canberra. So, <laughs> so where was your favourite place that you were posted? Oh, that's like asking what your favorite, who your favourite child yeah. is. Yeah. Um, no. It's they're right all different. Answer, is yeah. there? <laughs> there is because, I mean, I, my first posting out of out of uh, basic training was P, was Perth and I really love Perth. I love it. it was, it's a really lovely place. But... It has its drawbacks. It's really isolated. I mean, it's supposed to be the most isolated city in the world. And right. certainly in those days, well, in the early 80s it was because you, know, you had to just about uh, give away two weeks' worth of salary to get it on an aeroplane. Different yeah, now. Yeah, it's a long but, way, so, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But then Darwin's the same. I was in Darwin for a few years and it's a, it's similar and in, in it's really isolated. Um, it has a dry and a wet season. Wet season, you don't want to be there. Dry season, it's fabulous fun. But then What's, the work up there, work up there is really, really good. It's the it's the pinnacle for air traffic control. Working up why there. Why is that? But then I spent I spent many years at Williamtown, and as far as I'm concerned, you're not going to like this because you're from the Hawkesbury. But the Hunter <laughs> is God's country, and so you're allowed to say that. That's um, your opinion. You're entitled to that, so yeah, it's all good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I really, you, I really, you don't have a favourite. That's um, all good. Yeah, I was just yeah, going to ask um, and, in regards and, to the. Um, sorry, no, you go, you go. <laughs> well, I was going to say then. Then you look at Victoria. I, I quite like Victoria as well. I mean, Melbourne's a really nice place, and Gippsland is is a beautiful little area to the east of to the east of Melbourne. And uh, I was down there recently training some of the pe- some of the guys, and I was enjoying myself. You know, there's plenty of. It's a lot like the Hawkesbury actually. There's plenty of places yeah. you can go and be out in the country. Quite regional. It's really really pretty. Yeah, for sure. And how long have you lived in the Hawkesbury, Drew? I've been back here now. I've been here now five and a half years. Okay. And um, you enjoying being in the Hawkesbury? Yeah, I do actually. It's it's it is a lovely place. I um, I am discovering more about it. Um, I I tend to do a lot of I go into town a lot, so I'm, I'm a big theatre goer. But then somebody said, "Well, hang on, what about going to something like the Riverside Theatre in Parramatta, or going down to the Joan Sutherland in Penrith?" And I hadn't considered them, so now I'm considering them. But uh, but yeah, Hooksby is a nice place. It's very quiet. You know, people say, oh, "Where do you live?" And I say Sydney, but it's kind of Western Sydney, so I'm not in the rat race, and I, no. I avoid the kind of the the busyness of Sydney when I can. Sometimes I, I don't have a choice because I want to go into town or to Parramatta, but certainly Hawkesbury is is a lovely place to live if you've got to be in the Sydney area. Yeah, for sure. And you like to keep fit as well in your spare time. You do the park runs locally. Tell me a little bit about the parks and the, the favourite ones that you have. Well, I've, I've only done the park run at East Richmond. Uh, that's the the local one, which is along the along Hawkesbury Valley Way there near the the, the park that's between the information centre and the tennis courts. Yep. And I really enjoy that. It's, it's, it's flat and it's, it's, a, it's easy. I mean, there are other ones around here, like there's one up at Galston, but that has, that's a bit challenging, I believe. Um, yeah. There's other ones, the, the other close ones are at uh, Penrith Lakes. And apparently that's really nice because the difference between Penrith Lakes and East Richmond is you don't go back on yourself. It's one continuous loop. loop. Whereas yeah. with, uh, with East Richmond, you do, you go back on yourself a couple of times. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. It, and it's 5Ks and it's fun. It's just a lovely, a good distance where it's not too short but not too long. And, yeah. Uh, and I don't, I don't know what it is about Saturday mornings, but the last couple of Saturday mornings I've been, I've got up and it's been low single figures and I think, oh, I don't know if I want to go for a run. But I get down there and it's lovely sunshine and it's yeah. protected amongst the trees there and it's just beautiful. It's really lovely. Yeah, it's such it's a, a pretty one. sport, isn't it? Yeah, and then after that, we wander off down to the markets for, for breakfast. So we go down and get some either some nice Asian or some other sort of food down there. It's really lovely. We wander around the markets in, in Richmond for breakfast. 
Yeah. There's so many diverse cultures and different areas to look at within the Hawkesbury. And I love the market that's on the weekend, as you say. And mm. you can get anything from plants to produce to, you know, things that people have made themselves, the artesian trails. Um, it's just fabulous, the, the selection yep. that we have available to us. So completely we agree. We do. Yeah. yeah. No. And even – and we've – Close proximity to the mountains as well. I I um I took a friend up for a drive up to Lura for lunch on Sunday, and that was really lovely. We yeah. we went up there. We stopped um, a couple of times on the way up, including the Lawson markets. They're a bit they're quite a bit different to the Richmond markets because they're more they've got a lot more sort of handcrafts and stuff, and not 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 as much food. But uh, yeah. but that's really lovely to be able to be in striking distance of the Blue Mountains as well. Yeah, you've really got a nice choice. You can head into the city, as you said before, for a, a night of theatre or you can head out to the mountains for a beautiful day out. Um, and there's some great walks along there as well. And even by the river in Windsor, it's just such a beautiful place mm. to be. So um, lots it of is. choices. It's very nice. Yeah, so tell me, um, other things to de-stress an air traffic controller, would that be scuba diving? Is that on your list, I believe? Uh, you've been doing your research, Rachel. Yes, <laughs> as, you, as I said at the start, I'm not... I'm on holidays. This is my first holiday in about six or eight months. Did I, did I mention that I was on holidays? Um, <laughs> no, tell us about but, that. <laughs> so I started my holidays yesterday and um, I've given myself a, a few days before jumping on an aeroplane on Friday and going to the Maldives for eight days. I'll be diving, scuba diving off a boat for eight days in the Maldives. So wow. um, scuba diving... Scuba diving is a, is a is something I started doing when I was uh, a teenager in Canberra before I joined the Air Force, and it's just something I like doing. It's you talk about de-stressing, it, yeah, it's lovely because under the water, swimming around with the beautiful coloured fish and coral, and uh, it, depending on where you are, I've been to Fiji and to Micronesia, but I've also been down the south coast of New South Wales, um, and you know, as Billy Connolly says, there's no such thing as cold weather; it's inappropriate clothing. So. <laughs> the different places you, the different places you go, you just put the different different thicknesses of wetsuit on and and enjoy yeah. the scenery. So yeah, for sure. So I'll have a, I'll have a thin wetsuit in in the Maldives because the temperature is about twenty seven degrees. But uh, I've dived off um, Nelson Bay and I've dived down at the south coast where the water's been about fourteen degrees. So I have my six and a half mil semi dry on there. So this will it's be a nice, nice. Summer, summer's dive in the Maldives. Most definitely, yes. And living yeah. on a boat so we don't have to go back to the resort all the time. So we'll get up in the morning. The first thing we'll do is jump in our wetsuits and go for a dive and come back for breakfast. That sounds like a really hard life there, Drew. Well, <laughs> I'm a little bit jealous. <laughs> you've, got, you've, you've, you've got to de-stress. You've got to, you've got to be, you know, some people, It's you, 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 your holidays have got to vary. I mean, some people like walking around Machu Picchu and some people like walking around Eastern Europe and, and, and and some people like jumping on a on a cruise boat. I've done that too. I've been on a on a cruise out of Sydney for twelve days, and that was quite relaxing. Yeah. But um, but active tourism is good too, especially when you when you are fit and healthy. Definitely, yeah. And um, mm. you've been with us at Rachel Goldsworthy Realty for a number of years now. And mm. tell me a little bit about that as a tenant. What's your thoughts in regards to tenants and tenants in um, the Hawkesbury and and that sort of thing? Interesting, in, interesting question because you're my third property manager, um, and I'm actually pleasantly surprised with the way people around here do business. Um, I, I am a, I have been a, a long time landlord owning investment properties myself, and it's kind of one of the the tenants using it, the term in a different way. One of the tenants in in real estate investment uh, is property managers a goal, and um, I'm really pleasantly surprised at the way people do business here because they do, uh, well, certainly the property managers are active. I mean, uh, the previous uh, property managers were inspecting every six months. You do a, a, you do quarterly, which is a bit different, and you also bring the, the owners around. That's something I never did as a, as a landlord. I never went around. I just le left it to my, to my property managers. But after yeah. seeing you do that, I now do that myself. <laughs> I, uh, I, go, I go with my property manager and inspect my property, so... Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a that's a, I think that's a good way because you get to see the face of the the faceless landlord, which is which, which is good. I like it. Yeah, I think it is. And, it's all about transparency, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yes. 
Yeah. And I think, too, it's important to have everybody on the same page, making sure that, you know, not only is the landlord happy with the property, but also the tenant is happy with the property yes. because exactly. the tenant yeah. lives there. They treat it like their home. The home that you have is just immaculate. Like there's no blade of grass that is out of place. There's no, you know, the, the, the floors you get to eat off. Everything is so clean and immaculate. Um, and we're very lucky to have tenants like Drew that um, do such a great job. So we, we really appreciate your tenancy. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. No. Oh, I just... I met I met the I met the new the new um, the new resident across the road the other day, oh, and yes. we were discussing. She was watering her lawn, and I said, "I don't want to be that tenant that that rental across the road that has has weeds and grass and everything everywhere. It looks like a rental, you know what I mean? You go down the street and you know because I'm in a street with a lot of owner occupiers, and they're very yes. very house proud. And I don't know, I don't really want to be that guy. So no, I do. And I do. I yeah, no, I think we're very lucky. Um, we've got a lot of great tenants like yourself that do look after the properties and we have no problems at inspections when we do the quarterly inspections and um, I'm very pleased to have you on the, the team. So thank you. Yeah. The only thing I don't have, of course, is I don't have a dog, so I don't feature in a Tuesday dog. <laughs> the top dog, and which we have cats top and dog. rats and top all top sorts dog. of other yeah. things. <laughs> yeah. Maybe yeah, I should we, get we, a stuffed dog. <laughs> yeah, well, we could probably take a photograph of a stuffed dog. We're, we're not we're all inclusive. We're pet friendly, all inclusive, whether they're stuffed or not. So, um, you know, it's it's all good. <laughs> we're happy to include that. Every Tuesday, we put uh, what Drew's referring to. We put a top dog up, a photograph in the Facebook page, and it's just of different pets that I get to meet on the inspections that we do. And we have anything from birds to rabbits to guinea pigs to dogs and cats and pigs and sheep and birds. cows and yeah. birds yeah everything so uh, definitely and, lots and, of fun and um, yeah. lots of smiles as a result of meeting all their animals yeah interesting you got I, I just noticed you got you've got David sitting on your shoulder there I know hello David <laughs> <laughs> yes no David's um lucky enough to have him i really like him mum and dad actually bought him for me when i um had another property and i've just bought him with me i couldn't bear to to leave him at the property that it was bought for mm -hmm. so he sits proudly in the the garden of the office and um keeps me safe so that's a good thing <laughs> yes, um yeah. so tell me is there anything like if somebody wanted to become an air traffic controller let's get back to your original vocation mm -hmm. what what would they cool. have to do how, how would they who would they get in contact with? What do they need to do? The 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 primary, or well, they've got to they go to recruiting. Basically, uh, I'm not quite sure where the recruiting centres are around around Sydney. Uh, clearly, there'd be one in town somewhere, and I think there's some in Parramatta and Penrith as well. But you can, a lot of it's online as well. So it's just a basic. It's basically a case of the the recruiting will uh, direct you towards. Um, uh, to do um, stuff that tests your capability to do the job, because not everybody can do the job. Uh, so they'll be do, doing some sort of uh, testing to, for capability. And if yes. you pass those tests, then they will, uh, they'll start the ball rolling and you'll go through other things such as psychology testing, uh, uh, board testing for officer qualities, that kind of stuff. So um, it, it, it's a bit, I think it takes a while. I, I haven't been through that for a while, but talking to my younger peers and seeing what they've been through, uh, it, it, uh, it had, there is a process, you know, there's a, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of testing for, for, uh, yeah. for to see whether you're suitable. Uh, mm. and there, of course, there are two ways you can come in. You can either come in as a direct entrant as I did, uh, or, uh, there's quite a few that I work with at the moment who are, um, ADFA graduates. So if uh, if there's a student, if you you know somebody's got a student that they're looking at, sort of year eleven and twelve, and they're considering a degree, and they want to do something in aviation, I'm I'm I reckon it's a great deal. You know, you get a, you get a, a paid degree. It's not a free degree because you actually get paid to do it, yeah. and you don't come out with a hex debt, and you get a job to do at the end of it. So because you, you know, so you come out with a degree, and it can be anything. Because I I work with a girl who's got a a chemistry and geography degree and I work with guys that have aviation degrees and that kind of stuff. So they're reasonably diverse. Yeah. Um, and I don't have to do straight aviation science degrees. And uh, at the end of it, they do their initial uh, employment training, the nine months down at sale doing their air traffic control training. 
Yeah. And tell me, what's the mix of males versus females? I mean, you obviously will work cohesively together, but is there a higher percentage of males I would expect in, in that sort of a role? Or is that... Air Traffic Control in the Air Force has been one of those domains, certainly since I've been in it, that has a high proportion of women. Um, really? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I've worked in... It was, in fact, it was funny. You, funny because I was talking, to say, mentioning to a friend the other day how, when I, even though, when I first started in in in, uh, in, a, in the role thirty odd years ago, I worked in in areas where they had built the buildings in the in the in the seventies uh, when there wasn't this large female presence. And of course, the trouble with those is that the there was a, a large male <laughs> toilet. And you know, it had a, a, a locker room and showers and everything, and there was one female toilet that just had a toilet. And, of course, that's all changed now. Yes. Um, but yeah. certainly I think the percentage is about 35 to 40% women in air traffic control. But okay. I've certainly worked in sections where it's been higher than that. Certainly when I first got to Williamtown in the, uh, in the early 90s, it was 50-50. Wow. And is there a particular yeah. skill set that you would need to have, whether it's detail or whether it's you know, something else that you think is really important. If somebody was thinking about becoming an air traffic controller and wanted to study, what key elements would they need to have to be a great air traffic controller? The, the biggest thing is being able to uh, de establish and develop a mental picture, spatial awareness of the mental picture of what's going on. If you, if you can't th think in three dimensions, then you won't do the job. Right. So it's a case of taking all the different inputs, whether it be from a radar screen or from looking out a window or from the or from the radio calls that you get, developing some sort of picture in your mind as to where everybody is and then making sure that you either don't let them get near each other or you tell them where each other is so they can look out for it themselves, depending on what sort of flight rules they're flying by. So, right. Um, and it's also um, mental calculation. For example, if you're trying to sequence aircraft and that one aircraft is doing three or four miles a minute, we work in miles in, in aviation, nautical miles, and one's doing two miles a minute, you know the guy doing three or four miles a minute is going to be is doing is going fastest. But if Fast. he's got twice the distance, they're going to be in the same place at the same time. So yes. while they might one might be sort of twenty miles north, the other one might be ten miles south. In three or four minutes, you're going to be in the same place. So you've got to develop the ability to uh, see that that's going to happen. So you need to put in place some sort of separation standard. Okay. That's really fascinating because it's so true to be able to think on your feet and to be able to assess what's going to happen and how things are going to, to pan out. Because, you know, I've seen a lot of close calls on YouTube of different planes going from one place to another and there must be a great deal of pressure on you as an air traffic controller to get it right. Yeah. Well, the thing about how I like to to uh, I like to try to relate people's idea to it is air traffic control is a lot like driving your car, except there's a third dimension. So it's kind of like if you've ever watched the Jetsons, how how the Jetsons get around in, in flying vehicles, well, it's kind of like that because you're yeah. not driving on the road anymore. You're actually driving in three dimensions. Yes. The roads yeah. certainly do have, you know, th there is, there's, the roads have roads, so you generally can't deviate off the road to go where you want, so that you don't have to have that randomness that you do in the air. Um, but uh, but there are rules, same as you have on the roads. You know, you give way to the right, you uh, stop at red lights and that kind of stuff. Same mm -hmm. thing happens in the aviation world. The big difference, of course, is that in a place like, like a, an airfield, like Richmond, we have air traffic controllers that add that, that extra safety dimension because generally the pilots are flying, as I said, they're flying a lot faster. They yeah. don't have the kind of visibility outside the aircraft cockpit that a car driver does. So uh, there's that's why we have the air traffic controls. Having said that, though, there are a lot of places around Australia and the world where um, there isn't uh, air traffic control. For example, you know, you'll go to, if you fly out of here, for example, to... Um, to the west, so Bathurst, for example, there's no air traffic control at Bathurst or Orange. And so aircraft going to there would fly into there and do the same sort of procedures as you do on the road and you right. sort each other out by, by looking out for each other and talking to each other on the radio. That's really interesting. 
that um, there is no traffic control down at those sort of um, country locations. But you can understand it because there wouldn't be as much, um, you know, as many planes coming in and touching base. So I suppose, uh, you know, it's a cost thing as well. It would be very expensive to run Most the towers, I would expect. Yeah. 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 It's a cost benefit um, thing, you know. It, it depends on some places have, and it depends on, on how long you have the air traffic control going for as well during the day. Some places, for example, Coffs Harbour um, has air traffic control, I think, only about eight or nine hours a day, and it just mm. covers the, the regular public transport aircraft coming in and out, mm. whereas you get you know, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, which are 24 hours a day. Yeah, right. Tell me the photograph that um, you sent through for the the actual broadcast is in front of a search and rescue helicopter, I believe. Would that be right? And yes. if you could tell us a little bit about that and you're in uniform at that time. Sure. Um, I, um, I'm i still in uniform as a, as a reservist. I, I'm a reserve Air Force person as well, so I do occasionally do reserve work. Uh, that photograph was taken at Williamtown, and uh, at Williamtown, like all of the bases that have uh, aircraft that have ejection capability, have a, uh, a contracted search and rescue capability as well. So the aircraft you saw there is a Sikorsky S-76 helicopter that is completely uh, fit out for uh, for search and rescue. So it's got all a lot of the uh, infrared gear. It's got a big, uh, big uh, bright light on the front of it. It's got all different kinds of radios, but it also has capability in the back for taking litters, it has a, a winch on it and that kind of stuff. So they have them located at a place like Ambly, Williamtown, Sale and Pierce and they ha and, and Tyndall as well and they go to where the if there's an exercise on where they've got Hornets or PC-9s or Hawks who are ejection capable aircraft, they have the search and rescue helicopters as well. So part of my role when I was at Williamtown, uh, I was uh, part of my role where there was to be involved with a search and rescue helicopter, managing, helping to manage that contract. Yeah, and now you're out of uniform in the role that you play. Yeah, the um, what the air force did is that they decided that they needed a little bit of um, of uh, continuity and, and experience, and they weren't getting that because the the air traffic controllers have a, a career stream. The uniform ones have a career stream, so they they either want to go upwards or they want to go off and join air services and get paid lots more money and not get posted, right. and so. Places like Richmond, where you've got the uniform air traffic controllers, will come in. They'll they'll work for their posting length is about four or five years, and then they'll get posted somewhere else, or they'll get promoted and go and do some sort of staff job. So they needed a bit more continuity and corporate knowledge in certain places like Richmond because they weren't getting it. So what they decided to do was employ some of the ex uniform people to come back. And we, we are public servants. We are employed by the Department of Defence as public servants, but we're ex-military air traffic controllers. And we do right. exactly the same job as the – we do exactly the same job as our uniform equivalents, except most of us have got 30-something years of experience, and uh, we are supervisors and training officers as well. Wow. So a lot, of the, a lot of the people we get – a lot of the junior air traffic controllers we get through Richmond, for example, generally don't make training officer and supervisor level before they're posted somewhere else. Uh, and, but and that's where that's where at, at Richmond we have five uh, public servant staff, air traffic control staff that provide that continuity and corporate knowledge. Yeah, and I think you said you know it's really important to have that continuity because in any business, you know, in, in real estate, I mean, I was talking to Joanne who is the agency manager for my business, and we we worked out the other day we've been working together for nearly twenty five years, and um, it's a long time. Wow. And there's a lot of things that you share in that time and you could almost finish one another's sentences. Joanne, for those of you that don't know, she's actually my sister-in-law. So, um, you know, she looks after my brother very well and uh, they've got a beautiful family that live in Lower Portland. But she works beside me in what she does. And, um, you know, it's a very cohesive uh, situation within work because I think you get to know what's what the next step is, what their thoughts are, but also for the new people coming on, like you said, there's that continuity, they're able to train, they're able to yes. assist, and they know what your thoughts are in regards to certain, you know, things that you or processes that you do within the office. So it's great to have that continuity for the RAF base and um, yeah. to have the, the knowledge from yourself to be passed through the ranks as it was. And also you tend you tend to be the 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 
not so much the limiting factor, but sort of you, the new people are very keen and have their good ideas and stuff, but you don't want to reinvent wheels as well. That's you don't right. Want people can, oh, let's do it this way. You go, well, we tried that six years ago and this is what happened. So, yes, try that if you like, but <laughs> be aware that there are limitations in what you're trying to do. Yeah. You don't want yeah, to be in the stick in the mud. You want, to, you want to have innovation, but you also want to be a, a tempering factor. Yeah, I really like that that concept to be able to to have that there and um, try new things, but also look at what's already the tried and true that's already working and um, try not to reinvent the wheel too often, but to sort of tack when the wind is a little bit low and make sure you're heading in the right path. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing too, of course, with us is that because we have the experience, um, if, if things get a little bit frantic as they occasionally do, we. Because we've seen it, a lot of we've seen it all before. We we don't we tend not to get us we don't, well. That's our job not to get frantic and and uh, we are that tempering influence, particularly the younger people with uh, when they do get a little bit overwhelmed. Yes, you'd hold it together and make sure that they were steady on course. And um, I think too having the backing of somebody that knows what they're talking about and has the experience to be able to make that judgment call. Obviously, they're in the the, the um, helm and, and trying to do the right thing, but if they've got that confidence of somebody like yourself behind them going, yep, that's the right the right decision to make there, or, you know, yes, bring them in at this angle, or, you know, that's the, the weather conditions on the day and you can have them landing in this particular way, I think that's great. Yeah. yeah. As an example, the other day, we had, you know, the, the last sort of week has been brilliant autumn weather, where there's hardly been a breath of wind and the selection of the runway is wind dependent. You want the wind blowing into the nose of the aeroplane. Okay. And uh, my junior colleague was watching it very because the wind here varies so much between east and west. The, the runway at, at Richmond is east-west, so it goes east over Windsor or west over, over Richmond. And we were just watching the wind indicator vary between east and west all day and he was starting to chase the wind as to the selection of the runway. And I just smiled and I said, okay, I'll let you do that. And then after he, after he changed the runway about three, four times, I said, Why don't you just leave it there. Just leave it. And, and when the aircraft comes in or goes out, we'll decide at that particular time. And look at me yeah. and says, that's a good idea, Drew. Why don't we do that? <laughs> No, that's great. And listen, we'll leave on my favourite aeroplane when it goes overhead, the C-17. Tell me, it just has such a great presence. You see it in the sky coming mm. from a distance. It's almost hanging there and suspended, yes. but it's such a big plane. I mean, how big is it? What's the wingspan and what's the weight of it and what's the purpose? I know we touched on it slightly before, but um, it seems to be, I don't know what it is, but I just love that plane. It's, um, its wingspan from tip to tip is about 53 metres. And why I say 53 is because if it's more than 54, we have to treat it differently at Richmond because of the limitations. So it's just under 54 metres from wingtip yep. to wingtip. So you know, we're talking half a, a half a rugby league football field length from wingtip to wingtip. Um, it's about 200 tonnes. So it's a very big aeroplane. But um, because it's got such powerful engines... Uh, it the the runway at William, uh, sorry at uh, Richmond is only about uh, two thousand meters long, two thousand one hundred meters long, so it's just wow. over two kilometers. Yeah, the aeroplane yeah. can quite comfortably land on on that runway um, and pull up within about a third of that. How long's um, the runway? Did you say the two, two, the, two, the runway length is two thousand one hundred meters? Right. So it's just over two kilometers. So wow. the C-17 landing, depending on its weight, will pull up in about sort of 1,000 metres. I've actually seen the Americans, because the Americans come in here once a week as well, uh, from Guam and they go to Alice Springs. They, um, the C-17 is designed as a, as a, as a tactical aeroplane to fly into unmade airfields and, and on short runways. And sometimes they like to practice it. And I've actually seen an American C-17 come in and come in over the top of Richmond, land right at the front of the runway, the start of the runway, and he's pulled it up in about, he would have been about 800 metres. So he's taken this 200-tonne aeroplane doing about 240 k's an hour, and he's pulled it up in about 800 metres. So, you know, in, 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 in you know, just over you know, a couple of football field, football field lengths. You know, so it's, it's a pretty amazing aeroplane because it's got the power to get itself off the ground. 
but it's also got the power when it lands to put it into full reverse thrust and and uh, and pull it up really quickly. Yeah, and I presume it would take the pilot, you know, the skilled pilot to be able to do that as well um, to pull it up. Yes. So yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. that's terrific. Well, that's been the the whole um, interview has been fascinating for me. I hope everybody else has enjoyed listening to Drew talk about you know his career and the Air Force and what um, the RAF base does and what it is like being an air traffic controller. I really appreciate your time coming on the show today, Drew, and um, looking forward to catching up with you at the next routine inspection. That'll be, uh, well, you won't, in fact, because that's next week and I'll be in Maldives. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Just rub it so in a little bit more really... for everybody online. Aren't we happy yes. that he's going to the Maldives? Yeah. <laughs> so you'll have to let yourself in. Yeah, no, no troubles at all. We'll have a fabulous time in the Maldives. Thank you for everybody being online and we'll catch up with everybody on the next episode. Bye for now. Thanks, Rachel. See you later. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you so much for taking time out listening to today's episode. If you have any questions on the process of buying, selling, leasing or strata management, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and I'd really appreciate it if you could spread the word by liking and sharing this episode with your family and friends. I'm Rachel Goldsworthy and I look forward to catching up with you on the next episode of the Drive Home to Hawkesbury.